So we were just talking about when I first got an email address, which does raise the interesting question of when each of you first had an email address. Can you remember? I remember getting one. I don't remember exactly it was what the email address was, but it would have been sometime in either late 71 or early 72. Considerably earlier than the average person. Well, that's because email, <laughs> uh, network email, got invented in the middle of 1971 by a guy named Ray Tomlinson at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. And everybody jumped on that because it was such a convenient tool for yeah. communication across multiple time zones. Which is where I was working at the time. And, uh -huh. you know, I got an address that was something like Bob at BBNN or something like that. Some really That's small. right. It would have been like vinted uh, isi.edu. What about you, Steve? Uh, I'm sorry. Basically, same time as, yeah, as Vint. Uh, I, I moved from UCLA, where, where we were, to, to DARPA, what's called ARPA at the time. And uh, in short order, we had email addresses. And the effect was revolutionary because not only in our office where, where we were creating the technology or the people working for us were creating technology, but the director of the agency was fully on board. Yes. And he uh, very quickly not only liked it, but he decided to use it as a management tool for reorganizing the way he interacted with his direct reports. And he re required his people, these are very senior people, uh, to have email and to check it every day and to interact with him that way. Wow. Um, and it, it totally transformed the operation of the whole agency. But fair to say these are among the first email addresses in America. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> except they didn't quite look like today's email addresses because we hadn't yet adopted the domain name system. The at system. The at sign. Oh, we, had the right. at sign. No, we had the at sign, but we didn't um, have the dot com or dot net. That actually uh, came with the introduction of a lot of different networks when we turn TCP IP into, you know, a widely used internet protocol. So uh, put a pause for a second on the early days of the internet and let's talk about the internet today. Okay. I, I'm curious how online each of you are, how you use the internet currently. Excuse, excuse me, I need to check. <laughs> yeah, please don't silence your phones, please. Yeah. I did actually. Um, Constantly. Constantly. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I found I can't even sit down and write anything anymore without being online because I get halfway through a sentence and then I have to go look it up to find out some fact or make sure that I've got the right <coughs> story. So I'm online many, many hours a day, whether I'm doing email or doing Google searches or doing, buying things online all the time. And the same is probably true with me, except I make it a point from time to time to just wean myself from it. Like, you know, say, okay, I'm not going to be... On the, today, I'll look at my email tomorrow or the day after, and I'll suddenly find that I've got a thousand messages backed up and yeah. stuff I probably should have gotten to. But <clears throat> email might have become too easy to send. It, there is that possibility. Well, you get you so know, many of them. But anyway, Steve, Steve and I find ourselves online at oddball hours, early morning, late in the evening. Vint doesn't sleep. <laughs> um, and when I wake up, whatever time in the morning, there's email from Vint and uh, can respond. How often do you guys see each other? Well, let's see. We saw each other just two weeks ago in, yeah. in, uh, at the Computer um, History Museum. It was a big party. Uh, and, and I Bob saw you was, at the Marconi thing. That's right. You were in, in October, <laughs> late October. So the, we all live very close to each other, within a few miles, yeah. Bethesda, and he and I are in McLean. Mm -hmm. And we see each other with some regularity. You know, we get together from time to time. We all have anniversaries it, around it, the It's same. hierarchical. How often are we together physically? Uh, that happens, like here and, and occasionally. How often do we see each other in the sense of being on a Zoom meeting and see each other's faces? More often, how often do we send email or All other time. messages yeah. to each other? Um, every five minutes or six <laughs> minutes. <you know. laughs> okay. All right, okay. So the, this gets to my question of how, how let, let's list off the ways in which you use the internet today. It sounds like for research. How, much, how many hours do you have? <laughs> For research, uh, for directions, do you guys use uh, Google Maps or, yes, or Waze? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? Uh, for correspondence, obviously, we've covered that. What about for things like recipes or for suggestions on... Re recipes, how about an online book club that my wife has run for the last 30 years? Now it's online, it wasn't before. Uh, I find myself listening to music on YouTube all the time in the background. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's, you know, it's, it's shopping, I mean, wow. Yeah, is that true for you guys as well? Uh, <clears throat> for the most part, I mean, I will look up recipes. I will will listen to music. Um, we will uh, 
if I do directions, more often than not, it's going to be on my cell phone because uh, mm -hmm. I'm going somewhere. And it's still the internet. Yeah, is it's it still not? the internet, yeah. though. It certainly goes out through the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the big issues about the internet is that most people don't really have a good idea of what it is. It's interesting, you know, <clears throat> in the early legislation that we used to read, they just defined it as a network of networks. Left it at that. So you would say if you have two networks in your bedroom, is that the internet and do these government regulations apply to what you're doing in, in your own home? Um, and there was a, uh, I think Benton and my, my wife who's a lawyer were involved at one point in trying to define what the internet was. And so you could find that on the net itself. But most people don't really have a good view. And it, just like most people don't have a good view of what AI is today, yeah. they use it all the time. Of course, what is of course it? maybe it doesn't matter that they don't know, as long as they can use it. If you're writing legislation about AI, what does that apply to? Well, I think for a lot of people, the internet is a kind of magic. It's a sort of spirit in the air that brings me information. <laughs> it's not even a physical thing. The idea that it would go back to any kind of physical wiring connecting this node and that node. I don't think the internet is a physical thing. I think it's the implementation of the internet protocols that's physical. Should but we the take internet is, <clears throat> you know, the internet over the years has scaled up by a factor of at least a million, maybe 10 million, maybe even a billion. I don't have the exact number in terms of speed of lines, uh, uh, processor speed and the like. And that's only possible if you're not defining it as something a piece of the equipment does. It's not, it's not in the equipment, it's in the, well, abstract description of what the equipment needs to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's like describing the, interna the interstate highway system by velocity yeah. of vehicle. Yeah. You know, hang on. I, mean, I think it's fair to say that uh, Bob's taking an interesting philosophical view of this. <laughs> there are descriptions of how the thing is supposed to work, and you have to implement those descriptions in things called computers and routers and things like that. <laughs> so there is a physical manifestation where that implementation is done, but right. it's the description of how it's supposed to work that's important. So you can keep building new things to work in new ways to make internet even more interesting. But the, Where do you the, come out on this? You guys are talking about the plumbing. Um, uh, that's actually a good point. Uh, There's more for, to it for, than For the vast number of people, the internet, or even if you don't use the word internet, just I'll just use the word net sometimes this whole thing. It's just the ability to communicate back and forth to people. And um, for a few years, um, several years ago, I was going around saying, well, look, I, I didn't really understand what this network stuff was all about until I watched my wife interacting with our very young grandchildren every day, cross country, FaceTime, usually at bath time. And then, to my great surprise, we're visiting in San Francisco and we had one of our young uh, grandsons is standing by while she's talking to the uh, group in Boston. And we have two boys roughly the same age, you know, three, four years old. And all of a sudden, the one in San Francisco is peering intently through the phone, watching his cousin navigate potty training. And they're having rapport over the internet <laughs> 3,000 miles away. And I'm thinking, yeah. ah. this was not actually in the program plan. <laughs> so wow. what was in the program plan? <laughs> resource sharing, connecting computers together, connecting people together to do research, and connecting computers together to do um, complicated com uh, co uh, computations. computations that involved uh, potentially more than you could do on a single machine. So those three aspects, machine-to-machine -machine communication, uh, man-machine communication, and man-man communication in the sense of cooperative uh, uh, research where the th the basic three elements you have to know a certain amount of context if you go look at the program plan it did not go into great elaboration but there had been a fair amount of discussion and anticipation before that as which I would add that you can't do any of that without having kind of a f an efficient computer network that links these computers and so you know if you look at what went on there's research in three different areas it was research on how do you make an efficient, low latency, high reliability, cost-effective network? I got directly involved in that. There was another aspect which said, then, <clears throat> how do you get computers to connect to that network? How does that work? And then there were the things that you would do with the connected computers. And so those were three different research areas, and two of them actually became substantive implementation areas. How to build a network, 
and how to get the computers implemented so they could connect to that network and then let the research community have at it. Are, do you accept the mantle of founding fathers of the internet? Well, we're three. No, 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 did a lot of work on this in the early stages. Steve did work even before that on a previous system called ARPANET, which was an early experiment yeah. in packet switching. Bob was deeply involved in that at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. But uh, we had a lot of help, and there were a lot of people who came before us who were exploring some of these ideas. So we are among the founding fathers, perhaps, but um, certainly not the only ones. Among the founding fathers. Yeah, and I, I have you know consistently tried to answer that question by I'll explain the role that I played. Both Vint and Steve can explain that too. Other people can if they were around. But at the same time, trying to acknowledge the fact that nothing like this could ever have happened with a lot of help from people essentially all over the world. It originally started here, a lot of government support. Um, you know, I remember once at a meeting at the National Academy where some congressman, whose name I won't mention, got up and said, you don't really need all this government support because the private sector can do it all. And he pointed out the internet as an example of something that was done by the private sector. Never would have happened without the government's early, lead into the whole... So early and lengthy uh, funding. To so many other people, if you want to go take, argue that you deserve all the credit yourself. I would, of, I would never uh, heap excess credit, and I recognize this is a yeah. huge team sport, and a lot of people touched it and had contributions, some with us, some not anymore, and... We see yeah, the, like on the, the, the uh, two, so two things. The uh, 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 concept of team sport, uh, I think, is is really quite apt. One of the uh, critical things about the internet, about the way it's built, the way it's designed, the way it's operated, is that it is not a centralized operation. It, and, and I mean that in very deep sense. That each of the pieces are separately run, but they're interconnected and so forth. So that makes it, and has made it possible for various people, players, organizations, countries, and so forth to get involved on their own without having to ask permission, without having to centralize everything. So if you look, for example, at Skype, uh, uh, which made a huge difference in voice communication, and uh, it came out of Estonia. Estonia, who ever heard of Estonia? Where is that? Yeah. Um, that was not you know, part of the centralized planning. Yeah. So, so that's one aspect. Um, and then a, a, small, a small anecdote, I was in the... Um, rural part of Peru uh, giving a, uh, an ad hoc talk about internet stuff to teenagers at a, uh, a school. And this youngster uh, asked one of the best questions I've ever heard. He, he th it was thoughtful. He said, why is it that the U.S. Defense Department gave us this international network that we could use all over the place? And, um, and I could see from his perspective, he's sitting down in a you know, remote part of the world um, and looking at this thing that has sort of <coughs> changed his world completely. And so I had to think about it for a bit, and I realized that a lot of the origins go back to the uh, emphasis on technology and science that the U.S. experienced during World War II and before, and the enormous investment continuing past that point. And then you had uh, Sputnik, and that created ARPA and so forth, but it was all part of a, a big, long, uh, continuing push on the value of creating technology. But, but for the average American living today, experiencing the wonder and the yeah. convenience of the internet in general, and they might have a thought in their mind that they don't want to Google, and that thought is, how did we get all of this? Where did it start? What's the answer? No. Well, it started at DARPA, or ARPA at the time, which this, was this an is... agency of the federal government that was set up by President Eisenhower in direct response to the Soviet launch of Sputnik in 1957, I believe. Yeah. DARPA was created in early 58, is my recollection. Yeah. And it was actually spawned out of uh, uh, you know, a variety of mechanisms. I think other government agencies played a role. But the very first thing that ARPA did when it was created was uh, create a program to create what they called four space vehicles. I thought that was like three space, four space, no, but it wasn't. They were four vehicles that became the beginning of what became NASA. And this was really engineered out of another uh, funded group called the Institute of IDA, I think. And eventually NASA grew up and much of what was originally ARPA became NASA. 
And ARPA then became a smaller organization focusing on residual things that NASA was not doing. But, but so the, the initial goal was to help the military and certain academics no, and no, research. No, 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 stop. The, there was a, a project that preceded the internet. It was called ARPANET. Bob was the key designer of that. So, Steve Cocker led the network working group that did the host-to-host -host communications, computer communications part. The whole purpose behind that project was to figure out whether we could use this packet switching idea, which you can think of as electronic postcards, basically. Okay. And the second thing was how to get multiple computers to work with each other so the people doing research on artificial intelligence and computer science in the 1960s and 70s could share their resources. So this was advertised as a resource sharing experiment. You've got a dozen universities. We want them to share their software. We want them to share their computing capability. So the ARPANET was a resource sharing experiment. And it worked. After it worked, then the question is, what else could you do with this? And there were some ideas. This is, would be Bob at ARPA, coming from Bolt, Baranek, and Newman in late 72, thinking about, what about using this for command and control? Could we use computers to manage our resources better in the Defense Department? Well, if you're going to do that, you need to have computers in mobile vehicles, ships at sea, and airplanes. All we had succeeded in doing in the ARPANET was to connect all these data centers together by dedicated telephone circuits. It doesn't work and the tanks run over the wires and the airplanes can't get off the tarmac. So we had to design and build a radio-based system. And Bob had arranged for mobile radio, hmm. an experimental mo mobile radio system, which we set up in the San Francisco Bay Area and a an, uh, satellite system over the Atlantic. So we had a packet satellite system, a packet radio system, and the original ARPANET, and the problem was how to hook them all together. That's where the internet comes from. So, there, but at that point, it's still a military project. It's a defense department well, project. It's a DARPA well, research project. Well, to re so let's untangle that a little bit. Okay. Yes, it was a Department of Defense uh, sponsored program, and uh, ARPA was part of the Office of Secretary of Defense and later got spun out as a defense agency without any kind of change in uh, internal operation, just sort of relabeling. So yes, it was military in the sense that it was part of the Department of Defense. Um, and as an agency, uh, there was an awful lot of work that was focused on things that were unquestionably military oriented, building uh, net, you know, defense systems and, and you know, hard war fighting kind of Self things. Self-aircraft and things but, like that. But here's the critical thing. In other offices. Uh, in, in, in other offices. So, so here you have an agency, and uh, it's not a very big agency, 150 people, uh, top to bottom, and broken up into six offices. The number of offices changed slightly over time, but let's say six offices when I worked there. And most, most of the work was in this military, but there was, in addition, there were long-term investments um, unlike the sh relatively short-term investments on let's go build something that works in five years, much longer-term investments in basic technologies. And computers were one of those. They weren't the first one, actually. Material science turned out to be where there was a, a multiple set of interdisciplinary laboratories that were funded to do very weird things in, with material science. Uh, but then uh, this investment was made in computer science, so I'll, ca I'll call it command and control-oriented things, computers. And, um, and a lot agent, of interest in AI. A lot of interest in AI stuff. So ARPA, uh, which was founded, as Bob said, in early 58, but the office that focused on this stuff was created uh, a few years later, in the early 60s. And that focus was not on how do we uh, you know, uh, kill more people more rapidly or how do we detect it. And how do we develop the basic technologies that, if they come to fruition, could be used to develop whatever you need to do in in a more tightly connected military senses. And that work was primarily unclassified. That work was primarily open and available to everybody because it was recognized deeply that you take the fruits of that research and you have to make that available for other people to do things with. Hmm. And the fact that it became commercially available was a big bonus as opposed to how did that leak out. So the, the internet, the architecture, the technology is created for this mission over here. Right. When did humans start doing what humans do, which is use it for fun, for friendship? Right, at the very beginning. Five o'clock that night? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this is, first of all, 
computers are more damn fun to play with. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of games you can play. So that starts right away. You can forget the network. I mean, people play games with computers all the time. But uh, the thing that was most interesting, social phenomenon, email gets, uh, networked email gets invented in 1971. Very shortly after that, things called mailing lists got created. What, well, you know, so what kind of mailing list? This is where you send one message and it goes out to a bunch of people. So the first one I joined was called Sci-Fi Lovers. It was about the engineers arguing about who's the best writer and what are the best novels. And the next one I joined was called Yum Yum, which was a restaurant review hosted at Stanford about the <laughs> restaurants in the Palo Alto area. So I mean, it was evident, even in those early days, in the early 70s, there was a social component to the way in which computer communication was helping human communication. Uh, and, and in particular, people played games on computers before they were networked. I mean, you could go onto a computer and play a game on that network. There were some really interesting ones, even if you're only just dialing into one machine over the dial-up network. But I want to also, you know, escalate a bit and just simply say, when DARPA was created, it was created because of the launch of Sputnik, but to maintain a technological vigil for the country. Questions was, were asked, why did, why did the Soviets get there? For us, we had all the capability to do it, but it was nobody's responsibility. So ARPA was created to maintain that kind of vigil over what was possible. Oh, go explore things. Maybe you could fail. These were not things that had to succeed. But and computer networking is one of those things that just seemed like a very interesting thing to explore from the point of view of sharing computer resources but there's actually a motivation in the office that I eventually ran and Vint and I both worked in uh, <coughs> to figure out how to leverage expensive computer resources provided to one institution when everybody else might like them as well. So if you gave a very large disk drive to one university, doesn't matter which one, then 10 other universities might say, well, me too. Mm. Well, if they cost a million dollars for a megabit back then, which sounds crazy, but that's what it was, then what, or a megabyte, I mean, but then what do you do when, you know, you don't have the funds for it, and yet they all need it? Well, put them on the network and let them share it. You build one big computer. ILLIAC-4 was one of the very first supercomputers before the Cray machines. You got only one of them. So you really want to put it on the network and make it available so people don't have to travel to Illinois or wherever it was housed yeah. you know, interesting in order to use it. Uh, the National Science Foundation and yeah. the Department of Energy invest in supercomputers for a lot of different applications. And they very quickly recognized that the best thing they could do is to build a network and connect all the research universities to the supercomputers. And so something called the National Science Foundation Network emerged, another one of the several different networks that made up the early internet. So the fun starts right away at 5 p.m., as yep. you put it very <laughs> aptly, Steve. Uh, so the fun starts right away. When did the business stuff begin? When did the money people start circling and think, huh, you know what, this could be a business? This could be an application. I think there were two things that caused that. There was an acceptable use policy through NSF and, and elsewhere. When DARPA ran it, they restricted it to their contractors or places that DARPA approved, usually in defense. Um, 1992, there was a bill put forward in the Congress. It was passed in early 93. I call it the Boucher Bill after Bill, Bill Boucher. Boucher. Rick Boucher was a congressman from Southern Virginia, a <clears throat> very technically uh, astute politician. And what he did was create the ability for uh, the National Science Foundation to open up their NSF net to commercial use. Because it, it turned out that <clears throat> even if there were, you know, genuine research uses of it, that's why it was put in, let's say, to this university. Somebody there might need to call their doctor if they got sick. They wanted the connections to other places. They might need to talk to their family, which would be maybe in some other business. And eventually that happened. There were starts along the way. Vint was very involved in working with the National Science Foundation to expand it 
to commercial research institutions the, in a program okay. called CSNet. The reason I'm asking is because we all were sitting in a building that the internet essentially built, financially speaking, right? Yep. I mean, this is a couch paid for by the splendors of the internet. We're drinking coffee <laughs> provided by the splendors and spoils of the internet. So right. how come we didn't get the vodka that I asked for? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm sure yes, that they are, they, are, <laughs> they, they are titrating it right now right. through multiple pipes right. and filters, oh, and it's going to come out. It's Terrific be word to use. Glacier yeah. filtered. It's right. going to be So the, um, when did, for all the splendor mm -hmm. of what would come, you begin to feel there's also another side here. There's a lot of good but there's also potential for bad. Yeah, well, it starts to show up, uh, especially in social networking. It was pretty clear early on that anybody who wanted to say something could say whatever they wanted to say. And, uh, and we tended uh, not to be overly vigilant. But when we had distribution lists, these mail distribution lists, sometimes you had monitors and you had uh, people who would tell people to tone down or they would actually delete something that was harmful or, or not, uh, not constructive. But I think my reaction to internet and the potential hazards uh, is most visible as the social networking pops up and anonymity becomes your friend in the sense that you can say whatever you want and you're not held accountable. Mm. Uh, there were earlier indications, though, of other hazards because there were attacks that could be made against the computers of the Internet, the underlying systems, but even your mobile or your laptop or your desktop. So uh, computer security uh, has been a concern for most of the time that Internet's been around, more so today just because of the sophisticated attacks that can be made. But the social networking side of things uh, and misinformation and disinformation propagation, that has become much more prominent, I would say, in the last decade. Mm. When did you two first worry, Steve? When did you first have a, a sense that the Internet may not all be good? Well, um, as soon as humans started using it. Um, also 5 basically, p.m. Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, the tendrils uh, in the early 70s, you know, right away, we saw spam, uh, we saw harassment, isolated. Um, in the early days, uh, you could identify who was using it, you knew who it was. And then as things exploded, then you have this anonymity issue that so you don't know who's on there and there's no way to track down the person and there's no way to get them, to hold them accountable for what they're doing. So there was a, a big shift to them. But even well before that, there was misbehavior of one sort or another. And then as Vint uh, mentioned, there were vulnerabilities in the underlying computer systems which allowed uh, break-ins, hacking, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and now all of that has, you know, gone ballistic in the sense with social networks and so forth. But let me, let me, I wanted to draw together a couple of things. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bob mentioned AI in, in passing, um, and uh, you've heard a lot of discussion here about the origins of all of this and back at ARPA and so forth. Um, let, me, let me bring to the surface the following, that in addition to the idea of connecting computers together, uh, there were other closely related technologies that were being pursued within the same office. Artificial intelligence, graphics, uh, speech understanding, a uh, whole series of things. Back as, as early as in the, in the early 70s or even before that. And so these things all fit together. And uh, now today we have this explosion of AI, but uh, we were funding AI research right from the beginning, basically. And uh, the fact that that is now being fused together with, with networking, that you can access these systems, was uh, uh, really part of the original vision. Um, and can, so I, it, can I tie that together to say that, so is, is it fair to say that AI would not be possible without the foundational work that the teams you were part of were doing? I what? think, I, you never know what could have happened in, in some distant future. But I think it was the investments that DARPA made in that over a very sustained period, going back to at least the 1960s, if not building on ideas from the 50s, that enabled it to happen now, which would not have happened from, without some forcing function behind it. Because most of the, you know, the people working on it were in the research community. There was no obvious... Uh, <coughs> commercial value for it on day one. Mm. Maybe, in fact, in the mid-1980s, I started a program called Strategic Computing at DARPA 
There's actually a book about it that people wrote, a really thick book, which was intended to get commercial industry to take advantage of the AI work that was existing in the labs around the country. And it was the largest funded computing program that the federal government had supported up to that point in time. It was, we proposed it at a billion dollars, but uh, <clears throat> it actually had the effect of causing real things to happen. It also, behind the scenes, ended up being one of the prime movers of getting the internet from a research thing into a thing that you know, could be used commercially uh, by other people yeah. in the final analysis. So there were many things going on, and DARPA itself was investing in getting industry to become involved. But I think that the real concerns about what was going on weren't taken that seriously by most of the research community. Mm. Like, I, I met, but, again, I don't want to get into the names here, but I met with one of the people who is very well known today, not any of us, but for some technology on the net. And that was my complaint at the time. He, wa he wanted to come and you know, work, get some stuff done, having to do with promoting this technology. And I said, what are you gonna do about disinformation? Disinformation? Disinformation, you know, things getting wrong. We had people from <clears throat> who were saying, look, you're trying to identify information, but why even bother? Just take information and you know, let's say it's a document, <clears throat> identify it by the six most least likely words to be used. Look, look at the frequency of words in the language, take the six least likely ones and string them up in, in order of, <clears throat> of unlikeliness of use. And I said, you know, that's not a solution to anything because all I have to do to confound it is create a million documents that use those six words and they'll all have exactly the same identifier. You don't but, have a plan. But I think I, you guys are gonna comment on this and what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is all of the, the the kingdom of, of internet technology today mm -hmm. begins with a single cell organism. Are you guys part of that creation of the, the single cell? Well, are you there, at, are you present at the beginning of, that leads to the it, full kingdom yeah, today? There were, there were predecessors. There were some very, very without, smart, yeah. smart, smart people well before us even. But I'm, I'm building a follow-up question here, but yeah, the, okay. the, the reason I want to establish this and I think it's important is, you know, without your work, would the world we live in today be possible? No, we're responsible for it entirely, all yeah. by ourselves. <laughs> Obviously but, not. I'm not saying yeah, all by no, yourselves, but no, I mean the work that look, you were, we're part I, of. I think, yeah. I think a better way for you to think about this uh, is almost biological, which is where you're headed. But what, what we are a part of is this evolutionary story. And we mm -hmm. come in in part of the way through that. There were predecessors. We built on their ideas. And there are people who come after us who have built on their <coughs> ideas. What you see today is this evolutionary process, That's and it's driven by a variety of different incentives. Some of them are financial, some of them are social, some of them are just the desire to share what you know with other people. And it's all of the, the mix of drivers is what has made this thing grow so dramatically and be useful in so many different ways. You asked earlier, uh, you know, at what point does this become commercially interesting? And I would say that there were three visible phases. In the earliest part, the first commercially available thing that you could sell that was associated with the internet was called a router. That's a thing that took internet packets, these little electronic postcards, and looked at it and said, where am I supposed to send this? And or you out. could sell a Sun workstation, yeah. <laughs> even before that. Well, okay, fair, and well, we're, Not right. we're, we're in the <laughs> same time frame because Sun and, and Cisco get started approximately at the same time Cisco out of Stanford, came around, out of Stanford, 84. Six or no, 80, five? 84 then. 84, well, then, but Sun, Sun has you think 80, interfaces on it. So, okay, guys, you can go Google this. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the point Google is it. that in the mid 1980s, Cisco gets started and Sun gets started. So Cisco <laughs> sells routers and computers get used to use the ARPANET and then the internet. But by 1989, we have three commercial internet services in the US. One of them was called UUNet, another was called PSINet, and the third one was called SurfNet out in the, San Fran in the uh, Southern California. No relation to him. They, well, yeah, they spelled it, they, start, they tried to call it SURFNet, 
what else would you do in San Diego, right? Yeah, yeah. And then they discovered that there was a Dutch company that had already taken the name SurfNet. So they said, okay, why don't we change our company to the California Educational Research Foundation Network, CERFNet. Surf. And then somebody said, maybe we better call it in. So they called and said, you know, <coughs> is it okay if we call it SurfNet? My first reaction was, well, you know, if they screw it up, will I be embarrassed? And then I thought some more, and I said, well, wait a minute. People name their kids after other people, and if the kids don't come out right, they don't blame the people they name them after. So I said, sure, go ahead. Go for it. But the important thing is that these two things happen. First of all, you get routers and, and, uh, and, the, and computer equipment, like Bob said. Then you get commercial services. And by 1989, we start to see commercial service permitted by the U.S. government in the, in the U.S. connecting to the uh, government-sponsored networks. And the voucher bill that, uh, that Bob mentioned earlier uh, was the codification of that permission in 1993, but it was actually, give, I was given permission to make a commercial interconnection in 1989. Wow. But only for email. But only, for, only to connect only the MCI email. mail system up to the NSFNet backbone. So, Which, what, so what you're hearing is that in the, the, in the origins of all of this, the network the ARPANET was built, and then other networks were built, and then they were interconnected, but they were all restricted in their usage. They were for the purposes of doing research, and only the people who were involved in those research could use it. And the pressure to expand all of this for commercialization or for any other use was ever more building up, and the question was how to get through that. And it was sort of a, a problem of how do you take something that has from its origin is encumbered with the rules and regulations of being built under government contracts and sort of all of a sudden open it up to widespread commercial things. And so step by step, uh, uh, along with enabling legislation and a certain amount of uh, uh, creative interpretation of things and investments from outside and so forth. I, was, I, w I went to ARPA in 71. Uh, and I was there until 74. I was sitting at my desk one day, and a professor calls up and says, we've got to get connected to the ARPANET. I've got the money. Where can I send the check? And, <laughs> and I said, I feel for you. And you're a good guy, and you're doing great work, and it would be great to have you on the ARPANET, but we don't have a mechanism to do that. I don't have any way of taking your money. It has to be our money, and I don't have the money to spend to do that. But that was a specific example of, you know, you could see the pressure, mm -hmm. and then... Some years later, all of this is opened up. NSF, NSF found a way to get all of the universities, colleges connected and so forth. But it, it would take quite a few years to, to have this general so, open. I, I feel, I feel the need to inject a question from sure. you, effectively. Yeah, We've said nothing about the World Wide Web. And that's distinct from the internet. It's a layer of functionality that sits on top of the underlying communications capability of the internet. And the guy that did that work is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Hmm. He introduces this idea around 1989, starts working on it at CERN in Geneva, and then announces its existence in December of 1991. And the reason that's important is that that introduced the ability for ordinary mortals to generate content and share it with other people in an easy and convenient way. In fact, it was uh, around 1993 that the National Center for Supercomputer Applications released a version of a browser they called Mosaic. And uh, th that was, it hit the community by storm because it was the first graphical user interface to the World Wide Web. Yeah. Tim Berners-Lee's version was just text. So this was a big deal. And uh, who's the guy that, uh, that did Silicon Graphics? Jim uh, Clark. Jim Clark. Jim Clark at Silicon Graphics takes one look at this and says, there's a business here. He grabs Mark Andreessen and Eric Bisa, uh, Bina, who had done the Mosaic browser, brings them out to start Netscape Communications in 1994. They go public in 1995. The stock goes through the roof and the dot boom is on. Yeah. So it's really important to recognize that the introduction of the World Wide Web was transformative in terms of the convenience and ease of use of the underlying internet. The stake in the ground, I believe, that started all this was DARPA's creation of the ARPANET. It wasn't the internet, it was one single network, but by creating the communication network that allowed computers to link, by creating the means, the mechanism, the protocols that allowed those computers to talk to each other, as well as yeah. the network, made it possible now to have this community 
And the very next step, which involved, as Vint mentioned, creation of two other nets. One was the packet radio, another packet satellite net. Putting those three networks together is what created the nascent internet, and it was substantive, it was real. And you could ask yourself the question, since DARPA projects normally have a beginning and an end, <clears throat> why didn't the ARPANET have a beginning and an end? And the answer is, it did, but it happened so much later that there were so many other things that could pick up those functionalities, like the NSF net along yeah. the way, that people kept it around for that long period of time because it was fundamentally useful in a way that they could not experience in any other fashion. But I think, I think what people will want to know when they see the three of you who were present in the room, in the vicinity, however you want to take credit or not, <laughs> during these foundational moments yes. for this technology that touches our, our lives at every moment of the day, from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, is what you are proudest of in, in the evolution and, and also wow. what you're most afraid of mm. or what you most regret. Or concerned about or something. Yeah, I think, mm. I think those are the two things that you don't agree with the framing, it sounds like. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm, the, the question is, uh, the current kind of question, what, what to it, be afraid of. It's and, almost like you're present at the invention of the wheel. Yeah. And, and, and now we're allowed at a time when the wheel's being used for a lot of good. I got here on something rolling on wheels. There's also things rolling on wheels that are killing people, right? Like every technology is used for both so good if, and ill. If you, if you understand that this was a scientific challenge up front, could, could this be done? How would you do it? Yeah. Then what I would say in those early days, what I was proud of stuff for me was being involved in creating this commu computer communication network. The, the, the but not the early days. Part. I mean, now. It That's sounds the like very for early you, days. For you, Steve. Oh, the, now. The, the, yeah, for now. Like, all, all that has become yeah. possible yeah. because <clears throat> of the foundational work of people like yourself and many others that we don't have in the room, but we know their work. What, what it sounds like that FaceTime call for yeah. you, like that's something that because of the contributions of folks like yourself is now possible. So, so you use the word proud, and I, and I hesitate to use that word because I think the three of us know, and your viewers know, <coughs> that literally millions of people are, are engaged in making the thing that they use today work. Mm. It doesn't run by itself. There are a lot of people who spend their days making sure everything is working. Uh, but if there's something to be, uh, to celebrate, from my point of view, first of all, the fact that it's scaled up to the size that it is and it's still growing, and second, the diversity of applications that have been discovered, and the fact that they're actually supportable, they're sustainable from the financial point of view. And it's frankly astonishing when you look at this and say, that's, that's amazing that there are so many things have come together to make this a supportable and growing thing. I think I'm happy about that. I don't think pride is the right term here. Hmm. I, I, uh, a different aspect of this is the fact that this exists in a way that people take it for granted. Like, of course, the network exists, and it's just there. And uh, you know, uh, you're you're a youngster in our yeah. in our sense, and you have children, or there are children who you know, next generation who have never known anything else and uh, whose instant reaction to seeing a screen is to go swipe it. And if it doesn't swipe because it's an old screen, they don't understand why that it's doesn't broken. work. It's, it's a broken. very funny <laughs> phenomenon that happens. Yeah. <laughs> my, my youngest kids will drag a chair over to the, to the TV screen and try to touch it. Yes. Right. Yes. Stand up right. and then and try it to touch it. It doesn't they can't, work. <laughs> they can't understand why it doesn't work like an iPad. Dad, the TV is broken. Right. And, and uh, you know, so my wife and I'll be watching TV. We'll see somebody on TV and then say, well, what's the background there? And then all of a sudden we have all the information about who that is yeah. and everything. And the idea that that yeah. wasn't doable when we were youngsters uh, is, is, you know, lost from it's, consciousness. It's funny yeah, that it Steve, Steve should mention that Sigrid, whenever my wife, whenever she watches a movie, gets her laptop out because she wants to know where was the movie made and the yeah, story yeah. behind the actors and how much money did they make and how much did it cost. Well, I'm old enough to remember what, being in the living room with my mother and being annoyed because she'd be like, where did they shoot this scene? Is that Seattle? And then be like, Mom, quiet, we're trying to watch the show. But now people just sit there quietly and they Google, <laughs> where did they film this, you know? Yeah. Wow. It's, um, so what about you, Bob? 
what would you say is the, the most you know, satisfying thing, if anything? Well, I mean, technically there are things I can tell you along the way, as you properly pointed out. Those are early in my career. Um, I'm happy to see that it had such a big effect, particularly during COVID, because without the internet, it's hard to imagine how we would have really survived during that period. Yeah. Uh, I had, you know, inclinations that bad things could happen if we didn't really worry about them. Um, as I tried to mention to you earlier, and I still do, and I still think there needs to be a better mechanism for dealing with that writ large. But, you know, most people don't realize, you know, it's still a pretty fragile thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a grand cooperative. I mean, it's not like, it's like transportation. You know, there's nobody that guarantees you're going to be able to get from New York to here at such and such a time, you know, cause your cab yeah, may get a... experienced. <laughs> yeah. You know, your yeah, cab exactly. may have a flat yeah. tire. The train may come on late. You may, you know, who knows what could happen. And the Internet's a little like that. But I, I would put it in a different context for you. I mean, you were asking about what the Internet is and is it kind of real and tangible. You know, there's an analogous set of questions you could ask about America. Namely, what is America? And you could say America is, oh, it's the soil, it's the building, it's the people. But you might look at it and say, well, it's the architectural framework, it's the Constitution. Well, some of those things are really tangible. <clears throat> They're implementations, and some of them are not. If you were to <clears throat> ask um, Thomas Jefferson, what was he most proud of? You know, what would he have said back then? I had dinner with David McCulloch, who is a I very... I thought you were about to say you had dinner with Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have liked to. Sorry, would, go ahead. I would, I would have, have to fact check that one. <laughs> I would have had a lot of questions. And I, he, he's written a lot of historical books that are great. Yeah, no, I, I know mean, David McCulloch. I, I, I knew his work before he passed, passed away. He's passed away yeah. by now, but um, <clears throat> I said to him, uh, when do you think the end of the beginning of the foundation of America occurred. And I was asking that in the context of people that often ask, you know, or make statements about the internet today. You know, and they'll, they'll talk about things I did or Vint did or maybe Steve did, and they get it wrong. And, and, and they, they just invent it. And so as long as we're around, they could come and ask us about what we knew or other people if they were still around. And I said, as long as, you know, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington are all around, you could have gone and asked them. We don't have to ask, what would the founding fathers have said about this? You could just ask them. So I said, when did you consider the end of the beginning of America to have occurred? When, when, when were we beyond the startup phase? And he said, probably um, when power transferred from Washington to Adams because it guaranteed the continuation of the union. Wow. I said, but you know, you had <coughs> all these people were still around. You could have always. He says, well, that's another way of thinking about it. He says, in which case I would probably say July the 4th of 1826. And I said, well, why that date? He said, because on that date, exactly 50 years to the date, both Adams and Jefferson died on the same day. Yeah. Didn't know yeah. about each yeah. other. That's right. So, um, you know, I don't know what they would have said about pride. Maybe it would be pride to having created a new country May be pride of having uh, served as president for a term, maybe be pride of having transferred. But for me, I don't think of it at all as pride writ large. I mean, I'm glad to see that what we did made a difference. I'm disappointed to see that some of what we did has had negative consequences. Some of it, I'm sure, Vin or myself or Steve could have said, I, I could have predicted that up front. Net, net, net. Do you feel like the internet is a good? Yes. Unquestionably. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me yeah, complicate yeah, it a bit But now, now you have to flavor that a little. If we were cooking a recipe here, we could have this big good thing called internet, and that goes into the pot. But now we've got to add a little bit of uh, seasoning to this. I, I think in the early days, we would not have been predicting a lot of the social uh, effects that we're seeing now, partly because the people who used it were all kind of uniform. We're all a bunch of engineers, and we wanted it to work. Why yeah. would we want it not to work? We yeah. were spending all of our time trying to make it work. Well, today, you have people who have different motivations. They have different reasons for wanting to do whatever they do on the network. And in some cases, those are fairly harmful kinds of things. The one thing that we could have predicted 
and probably did predict and worked on was the whole problem of security in the network, whether it's confidentiality using cryptography or uh, you know, strong authentication using cryptographic methods. Those things you could predict ahead of time would be issues, especially in a military environment where secrets are important. So today we have the problem that we have less accountability for bad behavior than we need. Yeah. And we probably have less agency than we would like to have for people and organizations and countries to protect themselves in the online environment. So there's work to be done. This question of you know, the internet gets created and it gets used for a variety of things, not all of which are, are good, some of which are, are quite poor. Um, so one analogy that I've used from time to time is, uh, suppose I offer you a technology which is absolutely going to revolutionize transportation. It's going to bring people together. And, uh, uh, and it only has a small downside that we're going to kill 50,000 people a year. So the automobile, it's a little less because we've got some controls in there. So, you know, if you go back to the, you know, early 1900 era and you talk about, you know, we're going to create these cars and everybody's going to be, hey, that's great. Could you anticipate you're going to need traffic signals and policemen and you're going to have, you know, bank robbers running, you know. So would that mean you shouldn't do it or, you know, would you, should you control it and regulate it or whatever? A lot of complicated questions. I don't have any pat answers to it all. But obviously, the creation of, of automobiles, uh, j just to pick a particular technology, has been absolutely revolutionary in, you know, in life. In, the in, internet, a, in a positive way, you would say a net Absolutely good. in a positive yeah. way. Does it mean that, it's, that there are no negatives? Does it mean that there aren't problems that you have to deal with? The answer is, of course, there are, from, uh, you know, from traffic accidents and other kinds of things like that, pollution. to pollution and you know, yeah. resource consumption and, and all of that, and the impact on the planet. But that takes, you don't find that out until you do it. And then or you, or and then it scales you, up and enough. It scales up, and then you have yeah. to, you're not done. You don't say, okay, <laughs> you wait. only find out after you do it. I mean, with AI, doesn't that feel <laughs> a little bit risky? I mean, final question here on, on AI. Uh, for the engineers, the inventors, the people that are part of the team building AI globally right now, mm. people where you were at the beginning of, of email and ARPANET, what is your advice to them? figure out how this stuff actually works. Because so, right now, it's uh, not so clear. I'm, I'm, I'm That's gonna, true. I'm, I'm so, um, you know, Bob mentioned AI along the way, and we talked about the origins of all of this. The same, the same uh, vision, and the same set of people who were driving things for networking were also driving things for AI and driving things for graphics and so forth. It was all part of one very broad vision um, that computers would get smarter, they'd, they'd be more useful, and there's a spectrum of stuff there. And uh, uh, just from a personal point of view, uh, I, got, I got enthralled with the idea of AI back in 1960. And in 1968, it, I became aware that this one office was sponsoring all of this research, which included all this fancy stuff. And the networking stuff seemed a little less interesting than AI and so forth. But I got heavily involved in the ARPANET and so forth. And then I got invited to go to the ARP office. They wanted me to come because I had worked on the network. I wanted to go because I could get a front row seat on the artificial intelligence technology of the day, which was pretty, pretty weak by comparison today. This has all been, been building up over a long period of time. So when you ask, you know, uh, what do we think about where we are and where we're going and what the issues are? Uh, the answer is, uh, we, we've just begun. I mean, the things that you're seeing uh, and whatever issues are you know, being laid out in front of us about problems, are, you ain't seen nothing yet, um, for, for, for good, both for good and for, uh, uh, for ill. And we will gradually get our hands around the, uh, around the problem areas. Um, is that a so message of go for it, <laughs> AI researchers? Full speed ahead or slow down, figure it out. No, well, 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 go for it. Yeah, go for it. You have to. You have to. You have to. Otherwise, you'll be blindsided by somebody else who gets there wow. before you. And you don't know what you're dealing with. Wow. But I would also take it one level further and say that AI is a label for a field. And yeah. you can, I mean, education is a label for many different things. Medicine is a label for many different things. Uh, engineering is a label for many different things. And, you know, you need to look at them one by one. You, I mean, you can say there should be standards for education, but it's until you get into the weeds and figure out, well, what are the standards for this? What are the standards for that? Do they apply to two-year-olds, five-year-olds, 20-year-olds? I mean, AI is like that. 
it's, it's just a label for many different things, whether it's speech understanding, image understanding, natural language processing, expert systems. I mean, we lived through all of that, and there's, there's no general well, formula would, here, would you, would you, other would, than to agree that would, maybe we should look at it more carefully. Would you, yeah. would you agree, though, that we want to distinguish between figuring out how this stuff works or how it can work and mm -hmm. how we apply it? And so choosing what to use it for could be pretty important. I yeah. wouldn't want to talk to a chatbot about financial planning, to be frank. Okay. Although for entertainment, absolutely. Sure. I just had this funny image of, uh, of you guys uh, talking to a grandchild or, or two and saying, I didn't invent the internet so you could sit inside all day <laughs> play on your computer. <laughs> Anything like that ever come out of your mouth? Uh, no. My no. friends and I didn't build the internet so you could sit indoors all day yeah. and connect to your yeah. phone. No? We'd, we'd be Never? happy to and explain that to your kids. That's a downside as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the people... Well, on the other hand, it works on the mobile, so you can be anywhere and still get access to And the there are people who may... I mean, have you ever watched some of these TV shows where they say, all right, the cell phone's off the table, you know, not for dinner. Uh, just try and get a kind of a internet-free zone. It's very know, hard. It's very hard. I mean, I, 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 my teenager reads far fewer books than I read when I was a teenager mm. and, and has, it seems to me, a much shorter attention span. So, so I have to say, I though... I panic, I do. Have you, do you have any of the voice-activated appliances at home? I don't have... Yeah, the TV is voice-activated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about what happens at our dinner table. Yeah, today, it used to be that we would have discussions and then we didn't know the answer to something and I would jump up and run over and find the encyclopedia or the dictionary or whatever. And now uh, we just ask Google Home Appliance. And so we often have these conversations and when we get stuck... It gives a different flavor to who's coming to dinner. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, it's a very odd thing to just casually ask these questions and get answers back. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact is. that you can do that is slightly amazing. I, mean, I don't know about Bob and, and Steve, but since we've all had a hand in the development of this technology, and we have some sense for how complicated it is yeah. when you look a bit large, whenever I sit in front of a screen and do a Google search and I actually get something back, it's astonishing. It is when astonishing. When you think about all the stuff that had to work for that to, to happen. It is astonishing. The double-edged sword of it all, though, really does get to me. I mean, the internet was supposed to connect us, bring about world peace. Obviously, it didn't. It's supposed to make research no, easy, but think it, it makes thinking to, hard. No, I don't think it was supposed <laughs> to bring world peace. That's what Wired magazine told me in well, 1992. Well, I, well, I, 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 I made a mistake in a meeting that, uh, that uh, Vint and I were both out about. Um, you know, the, the vision that maybe would uh, bring people together in world peace and so forth. Vin pointed out the Telegraph had the same. It did. Yes. It was where they remember the book by, uh, called The Victorian Internet. Yes. It's a wonderful yeah. story. And if you look at the, uh, at the headlines about the Telegraph, you replace the word Telegraph with Internet, it looks just like the headlines from the 1990s. I don't, I, I don't know that, for me anyway, that I ever did anything in my life for purposes of defining a legacy or anything. I, I got motivated by interesting questions. I got motivated by scientific challenges. I got motivated sometimes by, you know, personal connections, wanting to work with various people uh, and finding challenges that were really interesting. I mean, it's really nice to see some of the technology you develop be useful for people. I mean, I, one of the best things for me was to seeing that the internet was around when COVID showed up because it really made a big difference. But you would probably find it surprising if I told you that despite the fact that DARPA came around and decided this was a good thing to invest in, it wasn't obvious up front that the internet was a good thing for DARPA to do. It, Amazing. I mean, the question that would be asked, and Stephen Vint can attest to this, what defense problem are you solving? Mm. And in the, in the early 1970s, there was no defense problem that required the internet because none of the military services had interactive machines. I mean, yeah, for the most that, part, that's, that gets back to the whole, you know, sort of creation story for for ARPA in that. Uh, the the time horizon and the uh, sort of the vision in the military was often too short, and the whole idea behind DARPA, um, in ARPA, and became DARPA, was to look forward 
and to build the technologies that would then be needed and I, I have. And, and, it, and it was a lot of money from a research point of view, and it was a, a infinitesimal small amount of money in terms of the big defense budget. Absolutely. So it was possible to make some big things happen, almost like a skunk works. It wasn't hidden, but it was just didn't get a lot of attention. In terms of legacy, I think it might be helpful to think in terms of a great, great grandchild. What do you hope they know or appreciate about the professional lives mm -hmm. and contributions that so you made? I, I, I can tell you, I was listening, uh, and uh, you know, what's on my mind is this, uh, and the opportunity to get involved with something that turned out to be useful. And I think that was one of my drivers, uh, solve interesting problems and make them useful to other people. And in terms of legacy, which I don't ever think about in those terms, if I think about my children and my grandchildren, and if you ask great-grandchildren eventually, that that idea of apply yourself to something that is satisfying intellectually and useful you know, broadly uh, is, is the right way to run your life and the right tradition, forget legacy, but the right tradition to carry on with. And it doesn't have to be directly in line with my technologies, you know, my, my particular skill set. Uh, it could be in many other fields. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we have contributed to scientific knowledge, at least, I mean, I can probably speak for these two as well, uh, contributed to scientific knowledge. We've been involved in really interesting projects. Some of what we did made a difference to other people. And in the final analysis, I don't think you can really aspire if you set out to change society, you will probably fail. And in fact, the things that change it the largest are usually those things that happen despite what you're trying to do. As I said earlier, and, ben, and, and Steve will both you know, know that for sure, we didn't set out to build the internet when we started. We were trying to solve some interesting scientific problems. How do you get computers to work together? Yeah. How do you share resources? You know, but eventually, little by little, we saw the potential. And you open your eyes and you see a larger potential out there and you say, okay, well, maybe we can do something there. And eventually, it becomes societal and it becomes political and it involves other talents than maybe a scientist has. And in fact, you know, some of us have been playing those roles in a limited way over the years following when we did some of the early, most important scientific and technical but, but work. Does regret play a role ever when you see some of the ills of the internet? Never for no. me. I, 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 I don't uh, feel any regret. When people say, well, what about all the bad stuff that people do using the internet? My response is that's their responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Bob and I and Steve helped develop the technology that makes the internet and the World Wide Web work. People get to use it however they decide to use, uh, use it. And if they decide to do bad things for it, I refuse to accept the blame for that. Yeah. But in, just in terms of legacy, uh, my, I just hope that something like the internet will continue to be part of the society that we live in. And that maybe some, you know, in some distant time, somebody will remember I had a tiny role to play in it. I love that. You should ask God if he has any regret for <laughs> creating humankind because yeah. of all the bad things that people do. And let me know the answer when you find out. Yeah.